On November 15, 2008, a Flash development company called Nitrome released Toxic 2, a game that would eventually be completely torn apart by just three speedrunners, who found and utilized a multitude of glitches and movement exploits to collectively set 40 any percent world records. However, to contextualize what this game is, why it's important, and how it came to be, it's necessary to go back a little bit further. In 2004, a graphic designer named Matt Annell was sick of churning out Flash advertisement games with little creative control. So, he decided to approach another graphic designer named Heather Stancliffe with the idea to found a mobile video game development company. Though Heather was initially reluctant, mainly since she had no prior experience with programming, she eventually obliged, and on August 10, 2004, Nitrum was born. Their first independent project was a Java mobile game called Chick Flick, where the player must maneuver two squirrels holding a trampoline to bounce some chickens into the nest in the middle. However, in 2005, a pared-down version of Flash called Flashlight started gaining more traction on mobile devices after Adobe's acquisition of Macromedia, the original developer of Flash. Matt and Heather decided to put together an extremely basic flashlight game called Foreplay, which was just a Connect 4 clone with some weird alien-looking characters. To have enough funding to market their independent games, Nitrum continued to make commissioned flash games such as this Adver game for Wallace and Gromit. However, they still lacked the capital to give Chick Flick a proper mobile release and decided to cancel it by the end of the year. The Nitrum crew redirected their efforts towards making web games, which had a much wider potential reach and were generally a more effective way to make money thanks to the sponsorship opportunities provided by Flash websites like Miniclip, Congregate, Armor Games, and more. With Matt's brother John having joined the team in May, Nitrum had the resources necessary to make their first foray into the browser game scene, and on December 6th, they released Hot Air, a game where the player uses a propeller to guide a hot air balloon through 25 levels while dodging various obstacles. While the gameplay mechanics were quite basic, Hot Air's most defining features were its art design, crafted by John and Matt, and its 8-bit music, written by someone named Lee Nicklin. While it wasn't unheard of in 2005 for Flash games to utilize pixel art as opposed to bitmap or vector graphics, it certainly wasn't common, and the ones that did just didn't have this level of polish. Nitrum was clearly trying to establish a unique brand that would set their games apart from the rest of the competition, something that they would propagate with their next release called Sandman, where the player must place down mounds of sand to guide some sleepwalkers back to bed, clearly inspired by the MS-DOS game Lemmings. Next up, Nitrum decided to make some lemonade out of their lemons by releasing Chick Flick as a browser game. From there, they just continued with their same successful formula, making several unique, fleshed-out games with Matt and John doing art design, Heather doing programming, and Lee writing the music. By mid-2007, Nitrum had created over a dozen unique IPs, so, expectedly, they caved to the inevitable and released their first sequel, Hot Air 2, which was essentially just a 20-level expansion of the original game. Two releases later, Nitrum created a 2D platformer featuring a hazmat hero who is trying to destroy a radioactive robot factory, marked by a strange prevalence of green acid. This game, of course, was called Toxic and it had 20 levels filled with plenty of hazards, including spikes, lasers, acid, and seven different kinds of robots. To progress through each level, it is necessary to use an assortment of different bomb types to remove sections of the light gray ground. However, this must be done carefully, because the player can only take four hits from bombs and hazards before dying, and there is no way to regenerate health. Touching the acid pool at the bottom will also result in an instant death. Though there isn't much to do in the game aside from just beating each level, there are a bounty of power cells to collect along the way. And speaking of bounties, as a result of all of the support you have given this channel over the past three years, I have had the ability to distribute over $2,000 in bounty and tournament winnings to dozens of people in the Flash game speedrunning community, which has helped facilitate some truly incredible moments and accomplishments. However, with this video, I wanted to put up some sizable bounties to help kickstart Toxic 2 speedrunning again. And to make that possible, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, a virtual private network that encrypts all of your internet traffic, masking both your IP address and your location, and it actually came in clutch while making this very video. 
In case you weren't aware, your internet service provider is able to throttle your traffic from any source, including online games and streaming services, at any time. I experienced this firsthand when YouTube videos randomly started taking almost 10 seconds to load, which was significantly impacting my ability to work on this project. Thankfully, by using Surfshark to change my IP and location, the issue cleared up instantly. Additionally, it is absolutely essential to use a VPN to encrypt all of your internet traffic when using public Wi-Fi networks, which can often be compromised in some way. The last thing you want is for a man-in-the-middle attack to turn your YouTube channel into the next hub for scam cryptocurrency livestreams. So, get Surfshark today to start taking your online privacy and security more seriously. And use code MAXIMUM to get 83% off and 3 months free. Or click the link at the top of the description. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk in trying it out. Thank you again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. So anyways, Toxic was certainly a unique 2D platformer that had a pretty good foundation, but it had some aspects that held it back from truly standing out, namely its sluggish, clunky movement mechanics, and the over-reliance on bombs as a means of getting through each level. With more polish, it certainly had the potential to be a really great game. And thankfully, a year later, Nitrum decided to revisit Toxic by releasing a full-fledged sequel, Toxic 2, on November 25th, 2008. Similar to Hot Air's sequel, Toxic 2 had bosses in levels 10 and 20 named Bigfoot and Mother. However, dissimilar to Hot Air 2, Toxic's sequel was more or less a complete overhaul of the original game. Everything about the movement was just way more responsive, the graphics were a lot more polished, the number of robot types was doubled from 7 to 14, conveyor belts and temporary platforms were added, and there were 10 additional levels that could be accessed by finding secret blue teleporter exits in some of the main levels. The power cells had a much more intentional function, as there were exactly 500 to collect across the game's 30 levels, with plenty of them being located outside the beaten path. Each level had at least one defining feature that made it stand out from the rest of the pack, which is usually referenced in the title that each one is given. Also, the game had an opening and closing cutscene that better showcased its story, with the hazmat hero entering Toxic 2's factory to destroy whatever is controlling the machines that have apparently overrun the planet, which turns out to be the mother boss that is fought in level 20. Overall, the game was a huge step up over the original by almost every metric, and its extremely tight movement mechanics meant that it certainly had a lot of potential from a speedrunning standpoint. That sentiment would only grow as casual players quickly found out that Toxic 2 is completely busted. Indeed, a large portion of the videos of this game that showed up on YouTube were of people showing off various glitches and exploits that they had found. Just two days after release, Running From My Shadow demonstrated that, in level 7.1, if you stand right here when the temporary blocks show up, the player will just start sinking into the ground, hitting the acid below if nothing is done. Alternatively, you could scale the segmented pillar by repeatedly pressing the jump key, and if a crouch position is held before the blocks disappear again, yeah. The next day, Perter showed off that it is possible to completely cheese the final boss by just throwing more bombs into its cavity right before it closes back up, damaging the boss and reopening the cavity, allowing the cycle to be repeated until the boss is finished off. The same day, Darkbones99 exited the level 10 boss arena while the gates were closing with a well-timed jump. This, of course, only served the purpose of soft-locking the level, as you cannot damage Bigfoot while outside the arena. Sadly, as Will9831 commented, you unfortunately aren't able to exit early from the right side, which would allow you to reach the teleporter to go to the next level without ever having to fight the boss. However, a far more exciting development came on December 2nd, when our old friend Running From My Shadow showcased a pretty huge shortcut in level 1. Normally, you are required to platform to the right, place a bomb against this wall four times to open up the corridor, and then platform upward and to the left to reach the teleporter. However, Shadow showed that you can just do this right near the start. This technique, which is now called wall scaling, is extremely simple to pull off. When you start sliding on a wall, you simply tap the opposite direction to initiate a wall jump instead of shifting the key presses. The player will immediately start moving back towards the wall, and if the tap was short enough, you will actually land higher up on the wall than where you started, where the technique can be repeated as many times as needed. 
Because of how dead simple this is to do, it is unknown whether it was intentional or not, but regardless, it allowed for level 1's completion time to be cut from almost a minute to potentially under 15 seconds, and it was bound to have other uses elsewhere in the game. Other glitch and exploit videos continued to surface, showing a temporary block clip that could be performed in level 9, killing the final boss in less than 40 seconds, a stand on air glitch when starting the final fight, crouch sliding onto thin air, a way to cheese the Bigfoot fight by scaling the right wall, the ability to simply walk in place, and the ability to not immediately die in acid pools by wall sliding. Additionally, there were tons of people showing off speedy completions of individual levels in the game. However, despite all this interest in Toxic 2's mechanics, nobody seemed to take a stab at doing a full speedrun of the game. This was the era of YouTube when video uploads were limited to 11 minutes long, which just wasn't enough time to store a full completion. People may have been doing runs on their own, but there is just no evidence to show for it. In fact, it wouldn't be until 8 years later, 2016, that Toxic 2's first world record would be set. On May 11, 2016, a runner named Americus performed a speedrun of the original Toxic in 14 minutes and 49 seconds. This would ultimately quickstart a brief record competition with another runner named Kazette, eventually stalling with Americus achieving a 12th flat on July 16th. Content with his time, he decided to move on to speedrunning Toxic 2, and with his first stab at it, he claimed a 122.04 on July 21st, which he easily improved to a 2019 10 days later after properly routing the game. He closed things off by getting a 14.58 on October 4th. However, he still hadn't recorded any of his runs, and a leaderboard for the game had yet to be established. So, let's fast forward to 2017, which is the year that I first got into speedrunning Flash games, as I competed with DHA for records in Run 2. In August, one of my best friends, who was aware of my newly found hobby, showed me some Flash games that he had gotten quite good at playing when he was younger, namely Super Mario 63 and Toxic 2. As an interesting tidbit, this is the same friend that would go on to draw, in about three minutes, the character that you see on screen right now. A character that has essentially become the brand for my entire online presence. I had played SM63 in the past, but I had never even heard of Toxic 2 or Nitrum as a whole for that matter, likely due to the site being blocked on the computers back in elementary school. Upon sitting down to play the game for the first time, it took just a matter of minutes for me to figure out the wall scaling shortcut in level 1 on my own. I was immediately captured by the game's fluid movement, and I instantly knew that it was going to become my next speed game. I never got the chance to play through Toxic 2 casually, because I was always looking for new ways to apply wall scaling and other movement techniques to save time in a speedrun. I recorded a run of 2105 on August 22nd, which implemented quite a few wall scaling optimizations. I performed the shortcut in level 1, skipped activating two sets of temporary blocks in level 9, did the right wall cheese strat in the Bigfoot boss fight, and skipped some temporary blocks in 14. In level 15, you are supposed to explode bombs in these pink checkerboard areas to create ground that the player is able to walk on. However, with a wall scale here and some daring movement later in the level, I was able to reach the end without throwing a single bomb. Additionally, a frame-perfect wall scale was used here in level 19 to skip some platforming to the right, and a normal scale on the spike wall was used to skip activating the second set of temporary blocks. Another important theme to note is the prevalence of damage boosting through spikes, enemies, and bomb explosions whenever possible. Granted, enough health has been budgeted to do so. The run was complete garbage, with me losing over 4 minutes from blunders in level 19, but I just needed something to be able to get the game added to speedrun.com through the Nitrim series. I went on to create a Discord server that served as a hub for all things related to Nitrim speedrunning, which is how I learned about Americus's unrecorded 1458, which became my new gold time to beat. The same day that Americus had posted that image, another runner named Connor McMahon had joined the server, who had been running Skywire for the past two weeks, which was a game released by Nitrum in 2007. Connor was originally set on playing various Nitrum games that nobody had ever speedrun before to build out a nice first place trophy case on his speedrun.com profile. However, after seeing that Toxic 2 had some activity, he decided that he may as well give the game a go. 
While I was slowly whittling my time down to that 1458, Connor easily outpaced me and leaped into the first place spot with a 1446 on September 16th, 2017. The run used very similar strategies to the 2105, but Connor had figured out a small optimization in level 4 where he placed three minor bombs on the ground near the start to dig out some of the ground below, which is supposed to skip a bomb placement later in the level, though he ended up being left with a sliver of ground that he still had to destroy. He also implemented a far more optimal way of doing level 8, where you wall scale to the top section and jump around while taking damage boosts from the lasers. Finally, in level 10, he decided to fight the boss normally instead of doing the cheese strat, which ended up saving him around 15 seconds. With this run, a three-way record competition between myself, Connor, and Americus was officially born. And with the game still having the potential to go a decent bit lower, we were all eyeing the game's next minute barrier, Sub-14. However, before the game's next record could be set, I discovered a new wall clipping method in Toxic 2 that looked like it could actually have some use in runs. After digging out this area at the start of level 4, I performed a jump in this position while facing the left. To my surprise, the character disappeared shortly afterward. I didn't know what was going on at first, but after expanding the window size, I noticed that the player was now stuck on the roof. This strategy, which would eventually become known as an upwarp, was made possible thanks to an oversight with the game's ceiling collision detection and floor snapping. At most times, there are three points on the bottom of the player, the left, middle, and right, that the game is checking for overlap with the ground. If a point is determined to be within the ground, the game checks a line of 100 units above that point for any floors. If a floor is found in that 100 unit range, the game snaps the player to that floor. This failsafe is necessary to ensure that the player doesn't just fall through the ground if they happen to clip in by a pixel or two, which happens quite frequently. With this failsafe deactivated in the code, the player immediately starts falling through the floor at the beginning of each level due to always starting a pixel inside of the teleporter. You can also see that contacting any corner is also quite problematic. The problem arises in the fact that the 100 unit range spans more height than the player and an entire block combined. If the game determines the player to be within a wall while the player is right below a block, they will be placed on top of said block. And, for some reason, the game only checks whether the top of the player will collide with a ceiling at points 1, 6, and 12 pixels away from the center in the direction that the player is facing. So, let's represent the region where the game is effectively checking for collision with a box. You may be able to see the problem here. As long as at least half of the player is not above the ceiling upon jumping while facing the opposite direction, the player will clip inside of the ceiling. Once the player has clipped far enough inside, the applicable floor snap checkpoint will realize that it is inside of a wall, and once the player starts falling, the 100 unit line check will start being executed every frame. The game notices a floor that the player can stand on within this region, the ceiling, and snaps them to it, completing the upward. Unfortunately, the areas in the game that this technique could be performed on were few and far between. In fact, on my first pass, I wasn't able to find a single place in any of the game's 30 levels where the glitch could be used in a way that saved time. Thus, it simply remained in the back of my mind as the record competition continued. On September 23rd, 2017, I claimed my first record with a 1424, simply saving time over Connor by having slightly better execution of the same strategies. Four days later, he punched in a 1413, with him nailing the early bomb strat in level 4 and taking a slightly different approach at the end of level 15. The run was easily on pace to be the first sub-14 going into level 20, but he sadly died after getting caught in the boss's regeneration zone, costing about 20 seconds. The first person to get a sub-14 would end up being Americus, who got a 1346 on September 30th. He struggled a bit in level 8, had an extremely strange occurrence with this wheel robot in level 11, and he took things safe in level 15 by creating ground at the start with a bomb, which cost around 5 seconds. Connor snapped back the same day with a 1327, which had a death in level 13 that cost over 15 seconds. Certain that 12 more seconds could be saved elsewhere in the run, Connor became the first to firmly declare that a sub-13 was possible, and that became the new goal that everyone was going for. 
Americus was the next to strike, setting a 1316 on October 1st, which incorporated the risky wall scale in 15 and had an accidental upwarp in level 17 that saved a bit of time, something which unfortunately was not able to be done consistently. Connor snapped back with a 1306 on October 4th, mainly thanks to him cleaning up that death in 13. I finally set another record on October 8th with a 1305, a run where I spent a considerable amount of time in the level 10 boss fight doing nothing. You see, at this point, we had gotten good enough at the boss fight to realize that if you manage to deplete Bigfoot's health bar before it initiates its first phase of shooting acid onto the floor, which occurs around a minute into the level, the boss just won't die, and subsequent hits won't do anything either, softlocking the level. This run also had the potential to be the first sub-13 going into the final fight, but I screwed up the boss throws at the start, costing around 6 seconds. With me at a 1305, Connor at a 1306, and Americus at a 1316, the milestone was truly anyone's to grab. And the next day, October 9th, I would ultimately be the one to win the sub-13 race, as I put together a 1252, which led to all three of us taking a break from any percent. Still, three days later, I finally found a use for the upwarp glitch that I had discovered almost a month ago. At this spot in level 16, an upwarp could be used to skip a small section of platforming, saving just a few seconds. But that was it. Nothing substantial enough to really draw people back to the category. In February, while preparing for an online flash speedrunning marathon, I got a 1223, a run which implemented an often frame-perfect jump in level 9 from this spike platform to the upper section, CoinFast 9, and the upwarp in level 16. Continuing to mess around with the game, I finally solved a mystery that had been perplexing us speedrunners for quite a while. People noticed that bomb sound effects and screen shaking would curiously occur after attempting to throw bombs during the short cooldown time after taking damage. We chalked this up to just being some kind of visual bug and didn't really think much of it. However, one day, when I was messing around with the runner bombs in level 19, I noticed that I was able to activate the explosion at any point after throwing some phantom bombs during the cooldown. It was likely that the bombs were actually somewhere in the level, so I expanded the window size to find that they were, for some reason, being sent to the top left of the level with their throw velocity maintained. I thought that this was pretty neat, but likely completely useless for runs. That was… until I thought of level 16. The top left corner of that level was an open area, with the ledges being just one block too high to be able to wall jump off of them. However, I realized that bomb displacement made it possible to get a bomb on the left ledge. Getting a damage boost from the explosion while at the peak height of a jump would maybe, just maybe, be enough. A strategy that could save almost 15 seconds. Unfortunately, it had taken me almost 30 minutes to hit it just once, so it would likely be a while before it would see use in runs. Bomb displacement works because of a pretty funny bug related to player states. For the animation states that the game allows you to throw bombs, like standing, ducking, jumping, and walking, a point is defined on the sprite that tells the game where the bombs are supposed to appear when the spacebar is pressed. If a bomb is thrown while the player is wall sliding, getting hit, or dying, the action is supposed to be cancelled. However, the hit state that the game checks for is not actually the internal state that the player is put in upon being damaged. Since getting damage causes a small jump of sorts, the player is put into the jump state. Therefore, the action goes through, but there's a problem. A point is not set on the player's damage sprite for where thrown bombs are supposed to come out of. When the game checks where to place the bomb, it gets not a number in return which eventually leads to the bomb getting placed at the 0, 0 point in the level, which is the top left corner. The code for this game is truly just one big bowl of spaghetti. On March 1st, Connor came back with a record of 1218, which was basically my 1223 with a worse level 14 and a much better level 16 and 17. That same day, I got onto a run that started off… quite horrible to say the least. 15 seconds behind going into level 16, I decided that I would go for the bomb displacement strategy as a Hail Mary attempt to save the run. I saved time in 17, golded 18, got fast 19 including a full wall scale up the spike wall, and had a decent boss fight, 1206. 
A new minute barrier was on the horizon, and me and Connor desperately wanted to be the first to get it. Three days later, I would win the sub-12 race by getting an 11.59 without the fast strategies in levels 9, 16, and 19. I was, however, assisted by hitting a faster cycle in level 14, first showed off by Connor, and by placing some bombs here in level 17 to skip a placement at the end, also found by Connor. Later that day, Connor was on pace for an 11.57 into the final fight, but the second set of bombs that he placed down didn't cause damage to the boss, making him end with a 12.04. Even later that same day, I set an 11.56 any percent time during an all levels run, which is a category where you unlock and complete all 10 of the secret levels on top of the 20 main ones. A few days later, I found myself sitting in class, quite bored, messing around in level 10. It had long been realized that if there were some way to get onto the roof at the start of the level before initiating the boss fight, it was likely possible to get past the right gate before it closed and skip the entire thing. This pipe structure looked promising, but a jump would have to be performed a lot higher than the floor level to make it work. I thought a wall jump off the left wall might just do the trick, but this annoying crevice on the left was making it almost impossible to even attempt. However, while I was messing around, I accidentally did this. <laughs> That crevice, the solution was staring us right in the face the entire time. Giddy with excitement, I held down the right button and landed on the ground to the right of the closing door. Bigfoot skip was real, it saved almost a minute, and it was trivially easy to do. All it required was a crouch to get stuck in the crevice, a right tap to get clear of the pipe above, and a jump. Sometimes, a right tap wasn't even required due to the player already slightly clipping inside the pipe from the crouch. When I got home, I threw together a pretty lackluster 11.13 with the skip, and then an 11.07 that was resurrected by Fast 16. The next day at school, I started poking around in level 20 to try to find any way of up warping to the ceiling, because it was also known that doing so would allow the ending teleporter to be reached without having to fight the boss. Unfortunately, the two spots in the ceiling that were one block thick just didn't yield a conceivable way to up warp. This spot on the right was promising, but it was unfortunately two blocks thick, so no dice. However, I randomly decided to try tapping right while clipped into the pipe, and noticed that I was getting a pixel or two higher than I was before, as that collision box had shifted clear of the ceiling on the left. It still wasn't enough height to up warp, but I had the thought to place a bomb inside of the wall. If I got a damage boost at the peak of my turnaround jump, it would possibly be just enough. Activate transport. The camera was bounded by the right arena wall, so I had to perform the rest of the movement off screen, but I eventually managed to reach the teleporter and finish the game without fighting the final boss. I noted that it was still possible to see where the player was going if the game window was expanded far beyond its normal bounds. But since this was an unintended abuse of Flash player itself to trivialize something that did require skill, a rule was added to the leaderboard that the game must always be kept at its original aspect ratio. After realizing that Mother's Laser could be used for the damage boost, the strategy was found to save up to 15 seconds. Not nearly as much as the Bigfoot skip, but still a considerable amount. With Sub-11 more viable than ever, I immediately started doing attempts when I got home. I got onto a run that was ahead of my 1107 into level 20, meaning that I was easily on pace for the milestone. But I got bad RNG with the laser, as it spun clockwise instead of counterclockwise, which was needed for the trick, so I had to back it up with a bomb placed in the wall. Still, I ended with a 1057, breaking a new minute barrier just five days after the previous one. I later realized that the 20 skip wasn't RNG at all, and was rather dependent on which side of the screen the player was on when the laser was activated, left being clockwise and right being counterclockwise. This revelation allowed me to claim a 1035 that same day, again without fast 9, 16, or 19. These three strategies, which came to be known as the gauntlet, due to them being the three hardest in the game, saved around half a minute if executed flawlessly. 
I vowed that I would go for Fast 16 in all future any percent attempts, but I ended up not needing to. As on March 21st, I noticed that this spot in level 17 was ripe for a turnaround damage boosted up warp, something that I, once again, found during class. The up warp could get you into this power cell room beyond the secret teleporter, and you essentially had to play through the level backwards for a bit to reach the normal teleporter, ultimately saving over 30 seconds. However, compared to the up warp in level 20, a bomb was required for the damage boost, the turnaround window was much tighter, it was harder to line up, and it was cycle bound by this moving laser. Thus, the gauntlet now had a new member, and combined, the four strategies saved over a minute compared to the world record. The next day, I got a 1014, just including the 17 up warp, and three days after that, I got a 1003, also hitting fast 19. Four days later, I got a run with fast 16, saving even more time than usual by damage boosting off of the robot on the right to displace bombs rather than using an explosion. After hitting an even faster 19, I entered level 20 at an unbelievable 9-3x pace, but I unfortunately got lost off screen and finished with a 944.633, still the first sub-10 by a mile. This whole time, while I had pushed the game from a 1218 to a 944 almost entirely thanks to new discoveries that I had found, Connor was following pretty close behind. Thankfully, Connor had also found a way to take Fast 16 from being one of the hardest strategies in the game to one of the easiest, by simply initiating the jump from the teleporter pad as opposed to the left side of the ground when the first bomb exploded. This makes the player always hit the explosion at the peak of their jump, and by continuing to hold left, getting a wall slide on the left ledge was essentially guaranteed. On April 24th, he reclaimed the record with a 942.867 after hitting the new 16 approach and saving some time in level 17 by reincorporating the early bomb placements. The next day, I found a difficult turnaround up warp in level 14 that saved around 2 seconds, but due to its very poor risk to reward ratio, it mainly served as a possible way to revive a dead run. However, a far more substantial discovery would come on May 1st, when I showed that it was possible to do this in level 4. It had been observed for quite a while that it was possible to clip through really thin segments of wall by running towards them at full speed and then crouching at just the right time. This was usually utilized to avoid having to place another bomb in scenarios where a bomb dug just a bit too short to allow the player to pass through normally, saving some time. The reason this works is because the invisible boundary that determines whether a player has run into a wall actually expands with the sprite when the player crouches. When this boundary is found inside of a wall, the game applies the appropriate amount of velocity in the opposite direction to keep the player from clipping out of bounds. Note that the player will not be pushed backwards when crouching next to a solid wall from a standstill because the game does not perform this check if the player has zero velocity. Rather, let us consider the case where the wall is thin instead of solid and the player is at maximum velocity, 12, before initiating the crouch a frame before colliding with the wall. On frame 1, the crouch executes, and the invisible collision boundary instantaneously moves to being beyond the thin wall. The game removes two units of velocity from the player and then checks to see if there are any collisions. However, because the boundary is not touching the wall, the game gives the go-ahead to move the player forward by 10 units. The process repeats, moving the player forward by 8 units, then 6, then 4, and finally 2, placing the player squarely inside of the thin wall. Upon standing back up, the middle test point on the bottom is found to be inside of a wall, so the player starts to sink, eventually falling through the floor, skipping around half of the level and saving around 20 seconds. The day the skip was found, I incorporated it into a run to claim a record of 929.1. With my sum of best now being an 848, it was clear that sub 9 had just become barely feasible thanks to the new discovery, and it became the final goal that Connor and I both set our sights upon. Connor came back with a 927.6 on May 6th, and I hit a 926.967 the same day. However, a substantial improvement wouldn't come until Connor set a 913.967 on May 8th, finally reincorporating Fast 9. He was also aided by a much cleaner approach in level 8 and going down with the wheel robot in level 11 to place a bomb on the wall early. The next day, I got a 910.667 without Fast 9 or 19, 
which completely proved the viability of a sub-9. The race to this final minute barrier was in high gear, and it was anyone's to grab. Americus had the first sub-15 and sub-14, and I had won the races for the first sub-13, sub-12, sub-11, and sub-10. After almost a year of close competition, this was Connor's last chance to finally have a minute barrier to himself. May 10th, Connor gets onto a run that is absolutely on sub-9 pace if he hits fast 19. However, he jumps too early and loses some time on the slower path. He finishes the run off-screen with a 902.567, a massive world record by over 10 seconds, but just short of the sub-9. The same day, I get onto a run that is just barely sub-9 pace entering level 17. However, I then proceed to do this. Taking a page out of level 4's new strategy, I used a floor clip to save a bit of time at the start of the level, making it much easier to hit the laser cycle later on. The player doesn't stand on the thin wall here because it doesn't interact with any of the floor test points when standing in this position. By walking forward, the middle test point then intersects with the wall, causing the player to fall through the floor. And it perfectly works out that you are able to clip through the pocket here after doing more digging. I didn't really save much over Connor due to my sloppy gameplay afterwards, but I still entered level 18 on sub-9 pace, even without fast 19. Level 18 was fine, but level 19 was sloppy, and I missed fast 19. 901.167 May 15th, Connor gets a run that starts off poorly, but he saves a bunch of time in level 17 with the new strategy, and enters level 19 barely on sub-9 pace without needing fast 19. However, it's just a bit too sloppy, and he opts to not do the spike wall climb, ending with a PB of 901.733, just short again. Thankfully, later that same day, one of us would finally pull it off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it, dude. <laughs> oh, it's over, dude. In three months, Toxic 2's any percent record had dropped from a 1252 to an 858, almost four minutes erased. The upwarps in levels 10, 17, and 20, bomb displacement in 16, a clip in 4, some other movement optimizations, and, of course, perseverance, were all that it took to completely revolutionize this game. Thanks to just a few oversights in the game's programming, and quite a bit of luck, Connor and I had turned Toxic 2's walls into liquid, completely transforming the game's any percent speedrun for the better. Thankfully, this wave brought massive improvements to the All Levels category as well. 17.1 is a bonus level that is filled to the brim with these flying robots that will constantly charge at the player if not disposed of. Optimally, it takes around 2 minutes to play through the level normally, but it is extremely easy to die right at the end of the level, which makes it by far the worst level in the run. However, I eventually took notice of the fact that the level's ending teleporter is not too far above this patch of removable ground. I thought that maybe, just maybe, it was possible to remove ground in such a way to make a damage-boosted turnaround upwarp to the ending teleporter possible. Well, on September 6th, I uploaded this video.
I completed the level in around a minute, cutting the level completion time in half. This made the discovery even larger than the Bigfoot skip in level 10, but it unfortunately did make the level even harder than it was before. Thankfully, it was able to be incorporated into a world record nine days later. On March 3rd, 2019, I found a double turnaround upwarp strategy in 13.1 that saved over 10 seconds, but that one has actually yet to be used in a full game run. Some other glitches and exploits used in all levels and 100% runs are this wall scale in 7.1 to skip basically the entire level, bomb displacement in 9.1 to create ground patches higher up, falling off the right side of level 6 to reach the bonus teleporter off screen rather than having to dig out this wall, an upwarp in 12 to reach the secret teleporter a lot faster, and this upwarp in level 4 that is used in 100% to skip a lot of backtracking after getting these power cells. Still, by the end of 2018, the game had completely died off, as Connor had given up going for sub-9, and I was finished playing the longer categories. 2019 came and went with almost nothing happening, and 2020 almost did as well. However, on November 20th, 2020, Connor finally got his redemption by claiming the game's first notable 10-second barrier, 84x, with an 847.667. He figured out that a crouch slide could be used just before the jump in Fast 9 to make the window slightly larger, and he finally hit Fast 19 in a run, albeit the backup variation. He also majorly improved the all levels and 100% records, runs that still stand at first place to this day. 2021 was another dead year. But in mid-2022, there was actually some activity brewing on the game's individual level leaderboard, with runners like Creeper Cheetah figuring out ways to optimize the game's movement beyond what had been seen in full game runs. Eventually, I came back to do some IL runs in late 2022. By March of 2023, I had managed to sweep all 30 of the any% percent level records, and when I created a segmented run of the records for the 20 main levels, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that the time came out to a 7.55, showing that, while a sub-8 isn't even remotely realistic, it is indeed theoretically attainable. Getting the sweep motivated me to make a return to any percent, and four records later, I pushed the time down to an 832.8, which is where the record stands today. In this run, I implemented a cycle save in level 17, first performed in an IL run by Connor back in 2018, where you throw bombs at the start while moving instead of squatting to ensure that they are placed in the right location, which saves around 8 seconds. The rest of the time save over Connor came from small movement optimizations such as jumping through the blocks here as they reappear in level 9 instead of doing these wall jumps. As it stands, an 8-2x is absolutely attainable, and an 8-1x seems like it might be the game's final frontier. Despite only three speedrunners having ever set a world record in Toxic 2 any percent, it has, by far, become the Nitrum game with the richest speedrunning history, both from a world record and glitch discovery standpoint. Out of the 146 browser games that Nitrum has made, of which over 90 are tracked on speedrun.com, Toxic 2 stands far above the rest in terms of its distinct brokenness and number of historic world records set in its main category. However, that's not to say that there aren't any other great speed games present in the Nitrim series. While I don't have the time to give every single game the credit that it deserves, some clear standouts are Colorblind, which is a cool puzzle platformer with some neat speedrun skips, Bad Ice Cream, which has seen quite a bit of activity and optimization in its co-op categories, and Flipside, which is a racing game that is quite optimized from an individual level standpoint. Connor has definitely made himself known as Nitrum Speedrunning's biggest specialist, as he currently has some extremely good records in more than a dozen Nitrum games, such as Colorblind, Hot Air, Skywire, and Toxic 2, in the longer categories. Overall, Nitrum Speedrunning is currently in a decent spot, but it could definitely be better. And, unfortunately, that is partially a result of Nitrum's own actions. The vast majority of Nitrum's flash game catalog is URL locked, a basic form of DRM that was commonly utilized to prevent random people from being able to download any flash game and host it on a website without working out a proper licensing deal beforehand. 
The game will check the URL of the website that it is being played on, and if it isn't an officially sanctioned source, the game will refuse to load. These measures are usually pretty easy to circumvent by cracking open the game and modifying the code. And, in fact, Toxic 2 runs are currently performed on a version of the game with the URL lock removed, allowing it to run in the standalone player. However, to prevent having to modify the code for every single Flash game that has a URL lock present, Flashpoint, which is a program that allows people to play over 100,000 archived Flash games on the standalone player, has a built-in URL spoofer that essentially tricks each game into thinking that it is being played on the original website that it was downloaded from, bypassing the DRM entirely. Nitrum's entire catalog used to be readily accessible on Flashpoint, which was great for speedrunners, but in February 2020, Nitrum requested that all of their games be removed from the platform. Nitrum, instead, desired to keep their games alive on their own website beyond the death of Flash player on the web through emulation. But, as of April 2023, just 62 of Nitrum's 146 web games are available in HTML5 and many are marred by abysmal performance and game-breaking issues, including Toxic 2. However, I'm sure that it's possible to look past all of that and still do speedrun- Oh. The current solution to properly playing most of Nitrum's fantastic Flash games is to manually add them to Flashpoint yourself a process which is quite convoluted and requires a lot more technical know-how than just downloading and double-clicking a .swf file. It's really not much of a surprise that the only Nitrum games that people consistently speedrun nowadays are their newer mobile and Switch games, a market which they began to occupy in the mid to late 2010s as the popularity of Flash continued to wane. Sadly, there currently are a lot of barriers to speedrunning Nitrum games, which is especially unfortunate considering the fact that Nitrum actually finds this stuff cool. Regardless, it is on us speedrunners to continue to try and make the process of new runners finding and playing these games as frictionless as possible. For Toxic 2, its speedrunning path began with Americus, who used the extremely powerful wall scaling exploit to complete the game in under 15 minutes. Once me and Connor came along in 2017, a record competition trio formed that led to the game being completed in under 13 minutes, as each record simply contained less and less mistakes. However, once an application for the upwarp glitch was finally found in February of 2018, the floodgates of discovery suddenly opened. Over the next three months, I found heaps of different applications for upwarping and clipping, and Connor found tons of movement optimizations and ways to make the run more consistent. By turning Toxic 2's walls into liquid, the record dropped by almost four minutes in that short span, and in the five years since, the time has come down just 26 more seconds. At first glance, Toxic 2's leaderboard looks extremely unassuming, with only four runners having ever touched the any percent category. Me, Connor, Americus, and Kazette, who is the current record holder in Toxic 1 with an 1153. However, if you flip the option to show obsolete runs, you can get a small peek into the storied history that this game truly has. And the ratio of 20 full game runs per runner is pretty insane. However, this is not where I want the story of Toxic 2 to end, which is why I am extremely excited to announce the following bounties. The next 20 people to get a sub-10 minute any percent run in Toxic 2 will receive $50 each. Additionally, the next 10 people to get a sub-9 minute any percent run will receive $100 each. That means, if you get a sub-9 while there are still slots left in both competitions, you will receive $150 total. Finally, and this is my favorite one, the next person to set a world record in Toxic 2 Any% percent, who isn't me or Connor, will receive $1,000. I find this one especially fun because Connor or I could improve the current record of 832.8, .8, which would make claiming this bounty even harder. Seeing that timing is certainly of the essence for the record bounty and the two personal best competitions, I would recommend getting started as soon as possible if you want a chance of winning something. To qualify, any runs must be performed on the latest speedrun edition of the game, have recorded video evidence with sound effects, and be submitted and verified on the GameSpeedrun.com leaderboard. 
Links to all of the resources that you will need, including the speedrun version download, the any% percent tutorial, the Nitrum speedrunning Discord server, and the game's speedrun.com page can be found in the description. There is also a link to a spreadsheet that will track this whole competition, so you can check there to see which bounties are still live. Also, remember to click my Surfshark link while you are down there. That's going to do it for this one, so thank you to Connor and Americus for making this project possible, and thank you for learning about the tale of Toxic 2. It's up to you whether the story continues to be written.